Hello, everyone. My name is Larry Drummond. I'm the executive director of the IPMI, and it's my extreme pleasure to welcome you to our webinar series. One of our founding uh, principles is the distribution of knowledge and experience from our members. Our focus is to provide the landscape for you to connect, learn, and build relationships. Today, you will learn a lot from our panelists, and also as we have a global audience, I am hoping that you can connect with others as the continuing process of learning process. We're obviously living in unprecedented times and it's created an unbelievable challenges for you in your personal and professional lives. My one uh, request is that we continue to collaborate together. I think it will help us uh, not only get through this crisis, but come out of this crisis much, much stronger. Before I introduce our panel, I want to take care of uh, some business in terms of our antitrust policy. So excuse me if I, if I read this to you, okay? Our general counsel, Steve Garner, has asked me to remind all participants that the IPMI has an antitrust policy and we must strictly adhere to that in all meetings, presentations, and discussions. While we usually pass this out to uh, policy out to participants, obviously we can't do so today. So we have posted that policy on our website, which can be found at www.ipmi.org. During our presentation and discussion today, we would like to stress that certain topics are off limits. These include any discussion on pricing, price changes, price differentials, profit margins, discounts, production supply, production capacity, inventories, sales, marketing, matters related to suppliers or customers, et cetera. Um, the, these areas are uh, really prohibited topics. I'd also like to uh, state as we have been getting some questions in uh, from uh, registered attendees, that we will not be taking any questions or comments that relate to third parties who are not represented uh, here on this call. So today's uh, webinar is focused on the Autocatus value chain. This segment of the precious metal industry not only uses the most amount of platinum group metal, but also is a vital part of the PGM supply chain through refining and mining. We have created a panel that represents various segments of the auto catalyst value chain. Our topics will cover the range of procurement, financing, manufacturing, recycling, and refining. It's now my pleasure to introduce our panel. Jonathan Butler, head of business, business development for Mitsubishi Corporation. Mark Caffrey, president of Numacore US Division. Oliver Preston, Managing Director, Pencil Recycling. Craig Oshawa, Global Sales Director, PM Refining and Chemicals for BASF. And our moderator, Becky Berube, who is President of United Catalyst Corporation. I'm now going to turn it over to Becky. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Oh, I forgot. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, Wilma, who is head of PGM for Metal Focus. My apologies, Wilma. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. We're excited to have everyone. Um, we hope this will be a very great presentation, great panel discussion. We're going to get started this morning um, with John, Dr. John Butler as he presents um, a little bit about supply and demand and, and, and pricing, what's going to, what's happening and, and as he, at the world as he sees it. John, we're going to go ahead and add your presentation to the stream. Great. Thank you, Becky. And thank you everyone for attending today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, first of all, hoping you can see uh, this presentation now. I'm going to uh, canter through this and then we can get into the, uh, the panel discussion. So here's the obligatory disclaimer, um, just to say this does not in any way constitute investment advice and um, the obligatory uh, advertising slide, Mitsubishi, as many of you will know, is a global precious metals trading house specializing in the PGMs, but also covering gold and silver, uh, spot physical forwards, uh, leasing and a whole range of other things, 
essentially all the full services uh, of a precious metals trading house. Um, let's get stuck into the, the presentation itself. And as Becky uh, mentioned, this is really focusing on uh, COVID and the impacts on the PGM markets. And let's first be clear that uh, not only does COVID-19 represent a global health pandemic, but it also represents the steepest and the deepest economic contraction in living memory, uh, perhaps ever, with unprecedented simultaneous collapse in both the supply side and the demand side of the economy. So we see this pretty clearly in this slide here, which shows the Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index in China, which was, of course, the first country to experience COVID and the first country to come out of it. And you see this very characteristic V-shaped recovery in the PMIs, uh, which is testament not only to a degree of pent up demand in that economy, but also the aggressive government stimulus that's taking place there. Uh, the United States, you see in the black chart there, their manufacturing PMIs are also deep in negative territory, uh, starting to come back, but still not yet in expansionary territory. And of course, this and many charts like it, whether we're looking at GDP or employment or a whole bunch of other metrics, uh, really the question is, are we gonna see a V-shaped recovery as uh, many of us would hope? Are we gonna see a W-shaped uh, recovery where there's uh, multiple lockdowns and economic contractions? Or is it gonna be something like an L-shaped uh, curve where we actually see a sustained uh, decrease in economic output over a period of time? Well, I'm not necessarily gonna give uh, the answers here today, but we can certainly look at what this means uh, for our metals. Here's the US unemployment claims. We're actually at a higher level now than in the global financial crisis of 2008. Uh, there's something like 20 million uh, new unemployment claims over the last month and a half. Um, that, puts the uh, that puts the unemployment rate at something like 20%. And of course, the question is, are we gonna bounce back from this? This is not an environment where people are rushing to the showrooms to buy new cars or other big ticket items. And what that's, that's done, this unprecedented slowdown has engendered a policy response. Uh, and we heard just today from the European Central Bank, who's aggressively trying to stimulate the economy uh, in the Eurozone. Uh, it's caused central banks around the world to lower interest rates to basically where they were in the depths of the last economic crisis. And in some cases, uh, even lower than that. And we expect that interest rates are going to remain lower for longer. And that's going to be quite interesting in terms of what it means for financing auto purchases, also financing in the precious metals industry. But what we do know is that when we get that combination of ultra low interest rates combined with potentially some higher inflation in the future, the real interest rate, the inflation adjusted interest rate uh, becomes uh, negative or is very low. That's the sort of environment where precious metals investment tends to do very well. And we've we've actually seen that uh, pretty strongly over uh, the last several months in the gold market. We've seen it to an extent in platinum exchange traded fund holdings, although they were also sold off in the general fire sale in March and April. Uh, and we're also seeing it in the physical demand for metals in Asia, uh, particularly in Japan, where platinum is being held as a, as a risk hedge, uh, but also because it's still got an attractively low price in yen terms. So let's look at some of the major questions here. Um, what does COVID and its aftermath mean for the supply and demand of platinum group metals? What does it mean for recycling? And what does it mean for financing and prices? Well, let's first of all look at what's happened to the auto sector in the three main markets of China, the US and Europe. Well, China once again has experienced one of those V-shaped recoveries where it was sold off, uh, where um, car sales were um, pretty much collapsing back in, in February. We saw an 80% year on year decline uh, back in February. Uh, they came back in March and April, and indeed the latest data for May shows that auto sales in China were up 12% year on year. Now that's pretty remarkable. That's not just a, a quarter on quarter or, or month on month uh, increase. That's actually uh, back to a higher level than it was before uh, COVID kicked off. And that suggests to us that there is a degree of pent up demand but there's also something else going on. And we believe that this is individuals are choosing to buy a car rather than to use public transport as a way to shield themselves uh, from the uh, COVID um, uh, virus. So we'll wait to see whether this uh, sort of trend is repeated elsewhere. So far, it looks pretty positive uh, for the US. 
Uh, car sales have increased on a month-on-month -month basis, as you see in the red uh, bit of the chart at the end there, but on a year-on-year -year basis, it's still in negative territory. And Europe is uh, very much still in the doldrums. Uh, the latest data, which was actually for March, uh, oh, for April, sorry, um, shows a 76% decline year-on-year uh, -year in auto sales. So it really is a tale of three markets and three very different sets of dynamics going on. Uh, in China, we are seeing pent up demand, and that's also being helped by local and national stimulus measures and also some pretty aggressive discounting from automakers uh, getting the public into their showrooms again. We've also seen uh, individuals choosing to buy a car rather than use public transport, and that is pretty important when you consider that only around 20 percent of China's population actually owns a vehicle. So there's a great deal of catching up to do if we're to reach the 60, 70, 80% that we see in the West. On the downside for PGM demand, we do see emissions legislation being delayed and we'll look into this in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, in the other markets, the US, uh, we do see something of a reopening of the economy going on right now. And although there are other uh, pressures uh, in, in the US right now, politically, uh, we do expect there will be a rebound in auto sales and eventually in the wider economy, helped by cheap credit and low interest rates. Uh, in Europe, uh, sales were falling even before the crisis, and the picture does look fairly bleak. Uh, patchy recovery, stimulus measures may bring some upside, but that's likely to focus primarily on battery electric vehicles, so no net uh, benefit to PGM demand. Um, but on the plus side, we don't see any delays to legislation, which is still uh, due to tighten with real world driving coming in in the next two years, uh, which should push up average loadings. Here's the picture in Europe, 76% decline year on year in April, and that represented only 200,000 vehicles being sold across 27 EU countries, um, pretty minimal overall. And then on top of that, we saw the diesel share decline in passenger cars to under 30%. Uh, about a year ago, it was 32%, but this is really the long shadow cast by the Dieselgate crisis in 2015, which has seen uh, attitudes towards diesel become pretty negative amongst consumers, but also policies uh, designed to actually phase out diesels in some cities and regions. And this is something we expect uh, will probably continue, unfortunately. It's not all bad news for diesel, though. If we look at the heavy duty side, uh, we do actually see emissions legislation, particularly in China and India, which are going to drive up average loadings over the next two or three years. Uh, we see the start of China 6 heavy duty uh, coming in next year. And then, of course, uh, India has already moved to, China, uh, to Barat 6, their equivalent of China 6, uh, as of last year. And that should drive up average loadings. And while the uh, bus sector is probably not going to do uh, all that well in this environment of shunning public transport, uh, what is probably going to do well is, is the heavy duty sector for trucks um, as localized distribution becomes more and more important and could actually benefit from some government stimulus uh, to individual companies as well. On the light duty side, um, it is still a positive story when we look at China and India in particular because of their moving towards uh, the Euro 6 equivalent legislation, which is going to drive up average loadings. Uh, these are uh, where palladium really comes into its own in the control of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide, and where uh, the control of NOx means generally higher loadings of rhodium. Let's drill down to China. Uh, China is, of course, the biggest market for palladium, 2.6 million ounces of palladium used in the autocatalyst sector there. That's about 27% of the overall palladium market. And generally speaking, China has been tightening its emissions legislation uh, in order to improve its notoriously poor air quality in some cities. But since April, uh, the authorities have announced a delay to the nationwide introduction of China 6A, which had been due to come in uh, uh, next month. And in fact, that's been pushed out now till January 2021. It only affects about 30% of the auto market because many cities and regions have, have already introduced uh, 6A early. Um, but for the remaining 30%, it does mean generally uh, China 5 vehicles will 
uh, still be sold and made, and those will have generally lower uh, emissions uh, standards and, and therefore lower PGM loadings uh, than for China 6. And in addition, um, many cities that have previously committed to introducing China 6B are probably going to go for the China 6A standard. And if you look at the CO limits there, they are quite different. And that generally means that the loadings of palladium will be somewhat lower on China 6A vehicles than on China uh, 6B. And similarly, the particulate number limit uh, with an enforcement factor of 2.1 starts to come in. All of this is due for introduction nationwide in 2023, but the deliberate delaying of, of some of this in regions that have previously been expected to introduce it early does mean generally that the loadings on average will not climb as fast as we first expected. And that's going to impinge somewhat on palladium and rhodium demand. Now, of course, a question we come across a lot these days is that of substitution, uh, in particular, removing some of the palladium used in light duty gasoline and replacing it with platinum, which is only 40% of the price of palladium right now. Uh, and clearly there's an economic incentive to do this. And these catalysts are very much technically feasible. We have some of the panelists today who can talk in detail on some of this. Um, but generally speaking, these catalysts were the platinum rich gasoline catalysts similar to those used in the 1990s when platinum was the dominant auto catalyst metal. Um, the issue has been for automakers that, uh, th that typically they need to re-engineer the whole vehicle because if you're going to put a platinum rich catalyst uh, right up to the engine, as many modern catalysts are, then you uh, have the disadvantage of that platinum sintering in the catalyst. So you have to redesign the vehicle layout so that the platinum rich catalyst is further downstream of the engine in the cooler zone. Um, and that means, of course, redesigning the whole vehicle and in some cases getting type approval. All of it's technical, technically possible, but whether OEMs will aggressively go down this route at a time when they themselves are struggling financially and also are facing a lot of challenges with electrification and other uh, regulatory issues, I think the jury is still a little bit out right now. Um, what we do know for sure is that OEMs are going to look at uh, thrifting their uh, content of PGM a lot more aggressively than previously as they look to lower the overall costs and um, help with their, their struggle financially. Uh, so we'll talk some more about that, no doubt, uh, in the panel later. But just to sum up this section, uh, clearly emissions legislation continues to be the driver of loadings. And although it is positive in general as we go out to uh, China 6 and beyond, and indeed Euro 6 coming in possibly the second half of the 2020s, uh, we do know that there's probably going to be some delays in China at least, uh, which are going to impact on the loadings. Um, auto industry stimulus measures, it's very difficult to see right now what they would look like, uh, but we do uh, have a feeling that they're likely to favour green vehicles, and by that we mean probably batteries and hybrids. Um, batteries, of course, are going to uh, potentially erode demand away from PGM uh, containing internal combustion engines, whereas hybrids are going to have similar, if not slightly higher loadings than a conventional vehicle. So overall, it's probably going to be neutral um, to, to negative. And if we consider that diesels are probably not going to uh, find much of a, uh, a ready audience uh, amongst regulators right now as they um, seek to, to move away from that technology, uh, we might expect to see further uh, impact on platinum demand as the diesel share declines. Putting it all together, um, here is the picture on demand, and I'm grateful here for the Johnson Matthew figures, the excellent uh, long-term data set that goes right back to the 1970s. And overlaid on that, I put in the Mitsubishi 2020 forecast. And as you can see, for all metals, we've got a pretty substantial reduction in demand this year, uh, largely uh, because of a decline in the auto sector. Uh, platinum is pretty well diversified in terms of its demand profile, uh, but it does see some weakness from the auto sector, uh, also from jewellery, uh, especially in China. Um, the industrial sector overall holding up quite well uh, due to mainly the petrochemical industry uh, benefiting from uh, lower feedstock costs. But generally speaking, we are seeing quite a significant uh, reduction in demand. Palladium, very similar. Uh, and also rhodium, although rhodium uh, holds up fairly well because of the loading increase uh, as we approach 
uh, Euro 6D, which is uh, focused mainly on NOx emissions control. And because of the real world driving component, rhodium loadings are generally increasing. So that offsets the decline in, in vehicle sales that we're expecting uh, for this year to a degree. So let's move on uh, to some of the other demand areas. Um, platinum, of course, has a substantial jewelry demand share. Here are the figures of sales in blue on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. That is an extremely um, uh, strong uh, period in, in March and April when prices were coming off. So there was very aggressive buying into the dips on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. Um, we think that that was partly industrial stock building, particularly by the glass industry, but also a degree of stock building and speculative activity uh, by the jewelry sector. Uh, I mentioned the petrochemical sector. Uh, again, this is an industry which has uh, really had a tough time when one considers uh, the issues of single use plastics that it was facing not that long ago. Um, it's quite interesting how single use plastics, particularly when used in medical applications, uh, have come back, come back into vogue. And uh, there's a lot of petrochemical manufacturers in Europe and elsewhere actually seeing much higher demand uh, for their products uh, for use in medical and other applications um, as we approach a post-COVID world. And that, generally speaking, combined with the fall in feedstock prices means that petrochemical producers uh, will probably continue uh, with a reasonable level of demand into the future. And that will also benefit palladium as well. We'll turn now to the supply side. And um, I've tried to summarize what's been happening in a very general way. Uh, essentially, the US and Russia has had no reported cases of COVID in its mining operations and has remained uh, continued to produce uh, mined output of PGMs throughout. South Africa, as, as many of you will know, um, has had uh, a force majeure at the major the three producers uh, since April, which was related to the national COVID-19 lockdown at that time. And Zimbabwe, although uh, no disruption to mining operations has gone on because Zimbabwe processes most of its output through South Africa, it too has been affected by the national lockdown there. And then we've seen one or two closures at mines in Canada as well. Uh, because of COVID cases. Uh, looking at the platinum chart, it's rather interesting to see um, just what a volatile ride it's been, largely on the back of some of this supply uh, interruption. You'll remember late last year, there was uh, this uh, relief that there was uh, three-year wage agreements put in place at the three major producers. And then we heard about uh, Anglo's force majeure because of its uh, converter plant problems back in March, but that was almost completely overshadowed by the drop in demand as we face the worst of the COVID crisis at that time. Um, since the middle of March, platinum prices have been climbing again. I think to a degree that's been helped by the physical tightness coming out of the lockdown in South Africa, which has reduced the amount of physical metal uh, coming into the market. But it is a mixed picture. Uh, if we look at where is currently operating and where is not, generally speaking, the northern limb mines have remained uh, operating, uh, particularly Magola Quena, uh, run by Anglo. That's an open pit mine. It's largely mechanized. And since the middle of April, that's been able to return to production. The issue is there that it's a very rhodium poor mine. So we expect a disproportionate impact on rhodium output because the really rhodium rich mines on the Western limb have largely remained closed. And it's going to be very interesting to see how social distancing is enforced at some of these deep level underground mines, which have very little mechanization and are um, really reliant on a very large labor force uh, to go underground each day. Um, so it could be well imagined that the ramp up to full production is gonna be extremely slow at some of these rhodium rich Western Lynn mines. Uh, and that is of course also gonna impact on uh, platinum and palladium output as well. So when we put together the picture for supply in 2020, uh, really, rhodium is facing probably the biggest impact uh, in terms of there being a, a, a very slow ramp up at the, those rhodium rich mines on the rhodium rich ore bodies. Uh, whereas platinum and palladium, clearly they're going to experience some disruption. Uh, but it's interesting to see here with palladium, 40% uh, of it comes from Russia. And Russia, as mentioned, has reported no uh, cases of COVID and not really any impact either. Um, there has been some impact on transportation and distribution as well because of air travel uh, being somewhat restricted. And that's actually limited physical availability uh, still further. 
On the recycling side, um, no surprise to see that the uh, closure of a lot of auto uh, sales points has resulted in fewer end of life vehicles uh, ultimately reaching the market. Uh, so there's been falling volume of scrap vehicles, disruption to some of the collection networks, disruptions to logistics also. Um, on top of that, there's been limited cash resources for a lot of smelters, especially with the rally in palladium and rhodium prices earlier this year. And then, of course, some refineries have also reported workforce shortages uh, and transportation issues. But you'll remember that back at the end of 2019, a lot of refiners actually had a lot of material in palladium and rhodium to process. They had a real backlog uh, of, of metal coming from end of life vehicles. So this COVID crisis has actually allowed uh, some recyclers to continue to process uh, and work down that backlog, uh, whilst at the same time um, clearing some of that, uh, that built up inventory. So where do we go to from here? It'll be interesting to see as that pipeline is, is rebuilt somewhat, as some of the COVID restrictions are rebuilt. I just wanted to mention also scrappage schemes. Uh, these are probably going to, to favor the uh, promotion of battery electric vehicles um, and unlikely to really um, favor diesels, uh, as far as we can see. Uh, if we look back to 2008, nine, the last time we saw sustained uh, scrappage schemes in various parts of the world, what tended to happen is the older, more rich catalysts came back, uh, particularly older diesel catalysts, and we'd expect that to have probably even more of an impact uh, these days as, as even more highly loading uh, loaded vehicles could come back. Whilst at the same time, consumers chose to buy uh, smaller gasoline vehicles uh, because the price points uh, made a lot of sense for some people. So the net effect is that demand for palladium and rhodium goes up whereas demand for platinum goes down and physical availability goes up. So that could have some quite distorting impacts uh, on the three metals. So if we put all this together into our supply and demand balances, and I would say there's a particular health warning on all of these, and that is that a lot can change in the next six months, both on the supply side and on the demand side. Uh, but generally speaking, we see the uh, platinum market moving into a small surplus, uh, from a reasonable deficit last year. Uh, but of course, if we see supply take longer to come back on stream than we expect, then we might actually go closer to balance or even into a deficit. Um, a lot also hinges on the, uh, on the recycling side, uh, how much of that metal can be made available in what space of time. Prices, of course, are still somewhat under the weather. And if we continue to see a degree of market tightness because of the shutdown in South Africa and also because of limited uh, transportation uh, capability for platinum, then we're probably going to see the forward market remain in a backwardation. Uh, despite prices uh, not really being anything to write home about, the forward market has remained in a back because of the very tight physical availability for immediate delivery. And this is rather an unusual situation for platinum. We haven't really seen it uh, this sustained for about 20 years. And this really speaks to the supply shortages coming out of South Africa, which as mentioned, we don't expect uh, to change massively anytime soon. Looking at palladium, uh, palladium is still in a deficit, but in a much smaller deficit than we would have been forecasting at the beginning of this year. And again, this is because of the, uh, the upswing in demand that we're expecting from China and elsewhere in the second half. Um, and supplies still remaining uh, somewhat constrained, particularly on the secondary material. And of course, uh, you may have seen a slide like this before. Uh, we've been in a situation in Palladium uh, for many years now of a fundamental supply demand deficit, and that's served to draw down near market above ground stocks of metal, and it's contributed, contributed to the extreme physical tightness that we'd seen in the forward market uh, for a long time leading up to this COVID crisis. Things have eased recently because there's been less physical buying by the automotive industry. But as the automotive industry gets back up and running in various parts of the world, we expect this physical tightness, this backwardation will probably re-exert itself once again. Palladium prices, it's been a wild ride. We've come off 30% from the highs, but we did see some all-time highs just before the crisis. 
uh, it's quite easy to see that demand could come back fairly quickly. We're already seeing that. Uh, car plants can ramp up in a matter of days or weeks, whereas it takes uh, underground mining operations several weeks or if not months uh, to come back to full production. So it's a bit of a balancing act on the supply and demand, although we are uh, expecting that both supply and demand will be lower than expected this year. Uh, if any one of those factors uh, is, is out of kilter in terms of the timing, uh, then we could see some, uh, some more price volatility than we've seen already today. And then finally, rhodium. Uh, we're probably the most bullish on rhodium because we see it moving into an even deeper deficit due to uh, the supply constraints. And even though we're seeing a year on year uh, fall in demand, uh, demand is still at, uh, at pretty high levels uh, historically. And again, no surprise there, we saw that real squeeze just before the crisis. Uh, rhodium has been even more volatile than palladium, as many of you will know, uh, dropping the best part of $10,000 an ounce within the space of a few weeks. So some tentative conclusions here, and um, you know, I'm sure the panel as well would, um, would like to, to pick up on some of these themes. Um, how will the auto industry look in a post-COVID world? Well, almost certainly there'll be lower demand in 2020, but uh, it's quite possible to see that things might pick up in 2021, um, provided we don't see a major recurrence of the virus. And also, as long as uh, government policies remain favourable to the auto sector and growth in general. Uh, the impact of the crisis on primary and secondary supplies, well, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty clear things are going to be lower uh, this year. Next year, it will be interesting to see whether we see all of those Western Lynn mines come back uh, uh, fully on, on stream or whether there's still some hangover there. The recycling mix uh, clearly favours uh, more platinum uh, coming through if we see scrappage of diesel. Uh, rhodium's an interesting question because although there is more to come back potentially from end-of-life vehicles, rhodium tends to uh, be the last uh, metal that you get out of the refinery. And options for financing, well, elevated prices and tighter markets do argue in favour of of higher lease rates and of course that's going to have some impact uh, on the AutoCAD scrap recycling sector as well. So you've heard it from me so I'm going to hand the floor now uh, over to Becky the chair and we'll be ready to discuss some questions. All right John I'm going to go ahead and uh, oh we've got it great thank you so much John that was an excellent overview. Um, as we've talked about the um, as you've kind of summarized, I wonder, Craig, you know, BASF had a, a, there's been a few questions about thrifting and about substitution already. Um, and I know BASF had an announcement this year about their project. Do you care to comment a little bit on the diverging trends and what COVID's impact will be? Uh, sure. Um, will we see some diverging trends? You know, certainly possibly in the short term. Take rhodium out of the equation. You really can't substitute it in, in the current form. It's really important for the NOx reduction. Um, it's in short supply, as Jonathan said, it will stay short. But platinum and palladium, as he said in the past, platinum was the dominant metal for quite a while. And I remember when it switched and palladium became the dominant metal for, um, for light duty. So um, yes, yeah, so in March, uh, BSF, Impala, and Sabania put out a joint announcement about a new trimetallic catalyst that would be heavier in platinum, lighter in palladium, and I, I presume rhodium neutral, but I'm, I'm not sure. This catalyst has seen some traction. It may be in, in a 2021 model or two, so it may be used in the short term, but I think more so in 22 or 23, you would see it, but it has gotten some attention. But coming out of COVID, we wouldn't see an expect, a major shift um, in the short term. Palladium is still short, platinum is less, rhodium is shorter. I think it was interesting that John pointed out that some re-engineering would be necessary to move the palladium rich cats from the front of the of the internal combustion engine would have to come back in order to prevent sintering with platinum. So yeah, it'll be interesting with car demand down yeah. and and auto, you know, manufacturing plants just getting back online to see whether the investment, as John said, would be would be made. So it'd be interesting to right. see. Uh, Wilma, you are a South African expert and um We've had a lot of questions going online, um, which we appreciate all of those of you who are watching uh, worldwide. But um, uh, let's assume that South African mines are slowly getting back um, to work given the challenges of COVID um, to contain the virus and they're gonna have some new workplace requirements. 
what do you think um, about the um, mine supply tightening versus the demand? You know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Becky. Yes, and, and Jonathan actually summarized quite well in his presentation. Um, but I think we need to think about, you know, the, the structural impact um, on mining of, of, of the COVID. Um, South Africa mining is incredibly important for South Africa, and there are many challenges. Um, so if you just look at um, how, how the mining operates, generating sufficient volume to keep the fixed cost per unit low um, is key to mining supply. Um, so, so there will be great incentive for miners to find ways in which to ensure that they have a continued su supply to the market. Um, but if due to COVID-19, see the mines are unable to resume um, production 100%, then there will be a reconsideration about on, on the configuration of the mines. Um, so um, we could see uh, a reduction you know, a permanent reduction in supply as there might be some closures um, in some areas. Uh, Jonathan alluded to the fact that, you know, uh, that the metals will be treated differently. So you'll see um, UG2 deep level mining have a greater impact on rhodium and palladium um, than on platinum. Um, and you could see that that, that mining houses will channel uh, capex to more open pit mechanized mines where um, you'll see an easier um, liberation of, of, of supply. So it certainly have a tight effect on the, on the, on, on, on the, the market per se if, uh, if, if the structural impact um, persists beyond um, being able to come to terms with de-densification measures required um, and being able to manage uh, the workforce in a different manner. Thank you, Wilma. Thank you. We've had very, um, we've had a few questions on Eurasian mining of palladium. We're not going to be able to address that um, really fully in this in this panel. Yep. We we don't feel like we have that expertise, but we thank you for those questions. Um, I want to move on. We have a, we have some other questions. Um, John alluded to the um, the Euro six and the China six emission standards um, and the impact of COVID nineteen on the timing of these standards and their impact on, de on, on the um, demand. So I wanna ask the panel, um, what, what do you think about the, the, whether the regions or the countries are gonna stay on track, they're gonna push back, John alluded to them being pushed back in China, um, but what will be the impact on PGMs for this, as well as um, with the low oil prices, um, what impact will that have on the electric, you know, on electrification of vehicles? Um, I'm thinking, Mark, maybe you might have something. Well, uh, thanks for the question, Becky. Uh, Umoco does follow the electrification of the vehicle closely and the development of, of battery, battery materials and the use thereof. Uh, the, the whole electrification industry is also interested to see what the effect of COVID is, is going to do to their entrance in, into the market. As far as people can see with their crystal balls, um, this, the COVID situation and the low price of the oil has little effect on, on the introduction of uh, electrification uh, into the industry. And as John had pointed out, there might be some government incentives uh, going forward uh, to uh, kick the automotive industry back into uh, gear. Uh, that would encourage uh, OEMs to push even more the, the, the EVs or the, or the hybrids. So I, I don't see this as, as stopping uh, the electrification one way or the other. Craig, did you have anything you wanted to comment about timing on emissions or? Um... Sure, thanks. Um, I mean, as Jonathan said, China 6 is about to come into play and, and that has not Really, there's been no hold put onto that. I think even uh, China Five production has to stop uh, later this summer. So, so China Six will happen. India Six probably will happen. And there's nothing really big that I see in Europe or U.S. coming. But what I would I would remember is there's right now, even before COVID, there was a there's an argument in California about should they roll back those regulations. And I think it's not so much a question of 
of, of, of COVID or economic stimulation, but it's, uh, I think on the November election could have just as much uh, an impact on, on, on if California rolls back or not. Thank you, that's a great point. Um, Several of our panelists, we all represent various segments of collection and recycling, um, primary refining of spent auto catalysts. Um, could each of you comment on, on your thoughts on the impact of COVID-19 in the short, ter short term, as well as um, 21 and beyond? Maybe Oliver, we could start with you. Oh yeah, so let me, let me give my view on the European side. Yeah. Oh please, yes, go ahead. You asked that question uh, like three months ago, the world was totally different, you know? Uh, Beginning of March, high metal prices, uh, yeah, capacities and cash was limited to all recyclers. So this changed dramatically in the last three months. So I think it, it depends really on, on the region where you're talking. If you look at Europe with uh, 27 or even more countries in the Eurozone or European zone um, with the lockdowns and closed borders, so travel um, was banned and uh, a lot of scrapyards were really hit by the lockdowns, you know. Um, interestingly, you see there's less car accidents because people are not traveling in March, you know, that for a scrapyard is horrible if you don't have scrap uh, accidents, you know. Um, so many scrapyards are still closed, especially the, the family-owned ones. Um, the steel, scrap steel prices dropped dramatically, you know, because there is no demand for scrap steel. The steel mills are closed. Um, the car dealerships are closed. That means there's no car sales. This means nobody will scrap the old car because he didn't buy a new one. Um, yeah, so that's that what happened. And, and also border crossing, you know, uh, uh, some scrap collectors usually travel from Eastern uh, Europe to Germany or other parts in Western Europe. Um, they didn't do that because uh, they, they had to go into self-isolation for two weeks when they go crossing the border, so they stopped. So that means for us, we've seen a, a completely standstill almost in, in April. Um, short term, it, it recovers, it comes back as, as countries ease the restrictions. Um, longer term, it all depends on how the, the economy comes back up. You know, if, if, if we have a V-shape, a U-shape, as, as Jonathan mentioned, it's difficult to predict. I hope uh, with the German government yesterday announced the 130 billion stimulus and all over the industries. Unfortunately, no incentive for internal combustion engines, but at least they lowered the VAT on 3%. So this could help car sales. Um, all the incentives go in battery and uh, hybrid cars. Uh, and, and also on, on heavy duty side. So they want to replace uh, the car fleet from uh, Euro 5 on the heavy duty side more to, to Euro 6. This will maybe push a little bit platinum demand. Um, but for recycling, obviously Euro 6 is PGM 3. So not good for us recyclers. This will be mainly metal PGM 3 catalysts that hit the road. Yeah, so looking forward what the stimulus, if, if the, the industry will recover sh soon. Thank you, thank you, Oliver. Does anyone else want to comment on just the your thoughts on the impact of COVID in the short term as well as beyond? Maybe I can just wade in. I think I think def definitely the stimulus packages would have some form of impact. I mean, as um, um, Oliver mentioned, um, we saw uh, Germany come out with that announcement, and there was also a, a little bit of a tax incentive there, um, reducing the tax. So, so they they would certainly have. Um, a positive impact, but I think that overall the PGM markets will be down. So, so I think think that what we can expect definitely in the near term in 2020, we'll see the markets down. And um, again, with many many, many kind of uh, disclosures around the impact and maybe a second wave or anything like that as we come out of of the COVID impact, 2021 would look better. But certainly, I think we um, will see demand and supply both sides of the PGM market impacted. I, I know a lot of recyclers, oh, Mark, just one second. I know a lot of recyclers are concerned about the cash for clunkers coming back. And I think we're seeing Australia um, take the lead in, in maybe bringing that back. Um, I don't know. Mark, you can go ahead with your comments, but that may be something we, we need to address, what the impact of that would be. For scrappage well, 
Well, I just wanted to make a point uh, from a Umocore standpoint. We're a very diversified company, um, so we're we're also uh, a, a prime supplier of catalytic converters to the automotive industry. And within Umocore, that's the activity that has suffered the most uh, because of the fact that the automotive industry has been shut and is only now starting to gear back up. Uh, on the other side, the recycling activity has been pretty strong. Uh, so I think we've had a very strong first quarter. Uh, we have been receiving materials uh, from all over the world. So, so I think you always have to dissociate the, the, the new material with, with the, the old material and, and recycling seems to be going well. So there will always be materials coming out of the recycling stream. It could very well be that there's a slowdown because of uh, uh, what Oliver mentioned. Um, but at the last crisis that we had in 2009, there was a cash for conquest program. And I very much expect that uh, governments across the world will be promoting something like that. And that will be bringing uh, uh, recycled material back into the, the, the stream. That's yeah. my point. Yeah, I think, uh, Oliver, I don't know about, uh, you're in North America as well as other parts of the world, but one of the hard things for recyclers right now is just getting cars at auction, right? Like Oliver said, there's not many um, people, as they don't buy new cars, um, they're not replacing, you know, there's not a lot coming into the stream. And the auctions are pretty, are pretty from, my, from what I hear from recycling community, the auctions are pretty um, sparse for, for getting cars. Um, so I think that, that there is going to be somewhat of an impact um, there just in the availability of recyclables, but hopefully that will come back. Yeah, let's, let's assume that uh, the incentives on electric vehicles will kick in and, and consumers will buy electric vehicles, then they will spread their combustion engine uh, cars. So there will be on the recycling side could be more material available, whereas the supply side suffers from uh, at the demand side suffers from uh, battery vehicles not using any PGMs. So this could be have an impact on the price uh, later on. I did speak to a General Motors, um, a, a, a GM for Toyota, who said between um, May and July, they'll only get 20 cars from Toyota for their, and, and they do about 200 cars a month in sales normally. And they only expect new inventory of about 20 vehicles through July 15th, so. Anyway, Craig, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I, thank you. I was just going to say that, you know, uh, Mark's right. Uh, the first quarter really was good. And, and you know, while the volume is a little bit off, I mean, it, it hasn't stopped. I mean, what we see is that it's a very localized thing. Certain states, some states are more, it's like the hotspots. Some states are more closed than others. Some states you almost wouldn't know that there was a, a, an issue and material keeps coming in. We do see, we hope, we hope that May was the bottom. And we do see Europe a little bit ahead of the of North America, just in terms of hedging activity. If that's any indication, how many people are hedging, how often they hedge, because that's that's an indication of when you'll receive material. And and so the UK is certainly second half of May started to pick up, and June looks better than May. And we're hoping that that the North America follows. Right. I think one other thing um, to add to this. I know we were talking about this phenomenon in China where. Um, people are actually actively shunning public transport and, and looking to buy a vehicle in many cases for the first time to have their personal bubble uh, to protect themselves. But um, in, in the West, we're actually seeing almost the opposite of that as well, uh, which is people have just discovered that they can work from home pretty adequately. So they don't necessarily need maybe not their main car, but their second car that they might use for commuting, for driving to the railway station or, or wherever. Um, so people, you know, may in fact be looking to uh, to get rid of that additional vehicle uh, and perhaps not replace it at all. Or if they do, maybe they take advantage of the subsidy schemes as we've talked about. Um, so in addition to the the natural flow of metal that may come back from any scrappage scheme, you might see uh, people making a conscious decision to reduce the number of vehicles that they own. And this also ties in with. Uh, some of the trends that were already emerging, particularly amongst the millennial generation, uh, to, to not own a car, but rather to rely on Uber or, or similar services. Uh, Vilma, would you agree that we that we may see an increased 
um, move toward electrification or, or yeah, I don't know what metal focus might think. I understand. I mean, I, I, th I, th I think that that's inevitable, but I think we do need to kind of place it into context that would we, we in, in our data set, we don't see that electrification would um, be significant or that big. Um, I mean, so it really does not kind of manifest itself in a big way until 2030. Um, there, about, there, about, so there is an increasing electri electrification happening. The incentives are targeted towards that. But, you know, we've also just recently seen that despite some of the, the declines in diesel share, there was also an, an, an increase last month in, in the diesel share in Europe again. So, so I do think that we need to put it into context. And Jonathan mentioned the fact that, you know, a hybridization, if we, there's a, a far larger shift towards hybridization. And if you look at our, um, our data series um, going forward, um, hybridization does not, in, in fact, it, it has um, a somewhat PGM positive impact. So, uh, so when we talk about electrification, I think there's battery electrification, so, so, so full electric, and then there's hybridization, which is um, uh, where we see a, a far larger dominance in the, the, the near to medium term. And that, that is PGM positive. Crystal balls. People have asked questions from the audience. Um, does anyone want to um, put a price to what they think is going to happen to the three metals in the in the near term or the the long term? I, and this is not against our antitrust or anything like that. We're just saying where do you think the markets might might lead? Oh, that's quiet. Sorry, I can move on to another question. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, I'll kind of venture because I think actually Jonathan did give us a little bit of an incl inclination around pricing, but certainly from, um, and I'll speak to more plat platinum palladium. It's it's not easy, not easy at all, but, but certainly easier than rhodium. Um, so just in terms of our kind of environment, that what we see being, looking at both um, supply and demand impacted. I think we are going to still see tightness in the market. Um, and, and we could actually, uh, we wouldn't be surprised if we see the peaks that we saw uh, for both flat and palladium being revisited um, going forward in the, in the, in the next uh, two or three quarters. Um, but you know, for, just from a kind of a price perspective, numbers perspective, Platinum, we would see ranges between uh, 650 and 980 um, for, for 2020. Palladium, a uh, range of between 1,500, 2,800, as we, as we said, we, 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 see, we see that palladium could easily test those peaks again. Yeah, and, and, and just to add to uh, to what Wilma just said, um, without uh, sounding too much like an echo chamber, uh, you know, I was going to put a slide up giving our price forecast for the rest of this year, but Platinum 850, which is probably slap bang in the middle of, uh, of the metals focus forecast, uh, 2000 palladium, but obviously some volatility in there. And I'm going to venture a, a, uh, an attempt at a rhodium forecast, which I'd say $9,000, but uh, beware both to the upside and the downside, because we've seen it trade on a very wide uh, band on either side of that uh, in the relatively recent past. It feels like George Giro should be here taking our, our, our prices and letting us know who wins <laughs> at Christmas time or something, or when we get to the conference, right? Um, this right. fall. No, that's great. And anyone else on the panel care to comment? I, I know we've kind of left that to the, uh, to the analysts, which Vilma is not a self-proclaimed analyst. Um, she is, um, by trade, South African mining expert, really. Um, but we appreciate the work that both of your companies do to keep us really abreast. Um, we do have a question from the audience that I wanted to get into because John, uh, you mentioned um, you mentioned uh, physical tightness and delivery. I'm going to show this question real quick. Um, there were some massive platinum and palladium imports into China in Q1, um, sitting in vaults or industrial stockpiling. Um, Thoughts on that? I don't know how accurate that is, but I'll let you all comment. Thank you, Jason, for the question. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Great question. I'll I'll, I'll just jump in and give give my view if if that's okay. Um, I mean, yes, you're right. Absolutely, there were big imports uh, in in the first quarter, and that also tallies with the big. Uh, sales volumes and platinum that we saw on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. We believe that that was a degree of industrial stockpiling. Obviously, buying any 
uh, buying platinum at anything that is kind of sub eight hundred dollars in dollar terms, uh, as it was, uh, looks like a pretty attractive level. I mean, this is below the two thousand and eight low, um, and in local currency terms, it was similarly uh, at a discount to to the recent price. Um, some of that was was almost certainly going into the glass manufacturing industry. Uh, fiberglass sector in China is still doing remarkably well. Um, aided as it is by government subsidies and aggressive expansions into markets that haven't put up uh, trade barriers as increasingly um, some countries do. The, the other part of it is, of course, with high rhodium prices, we're seeing a shift from rhodium, uh, relatively rhodium rich um, uh, glass melting tanks, maybe 20% rhodium to 10 or even 5% rhodium. Um, and that, of course, that difference is made up by the platinum, which goes up by 10 or 15%. So there's definitely that was happening. For the palladium, and it's a, a bit less visible as to where the palladium goes. Uh, the official statistics, of course, show the imports, but then we don't see that necessarily getting sold on within China. It's not a traded product in the way that platinum is on the SGE. Um, but what we do know is there's virtually no hedging that goes on by the OEMs, by the car makers in China. So they live very much hand to mouth in terms of purchasing their requirements and putting that on vehicles. And I'd, I'd venture a guess um, as to why we saw that that stockpiling. I think um, there was clearly a buying opportunity. Um, palladium prices came down uh, nearly a thousand dollars over the space of a few weeks. Uh, so buying into that dip by automakers who knew that sooner or later they were going to have to use that metal on vehicles. And indeed, we're seeing that happen now with vehicle sales um, exhibit that V-shaped recovery. Uh, the, the, the focus being very much on stimulating the auto industry in China. Uh, so I think it was strategic buying. Um, the, the fact that we're not seeing it so much in the West, uh, even though we not only have low uh, metal prices, but we also have these pretty substantial backwardations. It means that in normal times, uh, the auto industry would be going great guns on hedging. Um, but the fact that it's so uncertain, the fact that they have so many challenges uh, to their businesses in the near future means that they're not aggressively coming into the market and buying. But there will come a time when they have to do that, when there are signs that their production uh, forecasts are increasing, that uh, demand is coming back. Um, and particularly in the case of rhodium, where they need to secure their physical supplies um, for, for Euro 6, that's going to be when I think we see uh, a, degree of, a degree of forward buying coming in from the auto industry um, in, in Europe and the US. Thank you, John. Wilma, you have a few more questions coming up from our audience about um, South Africa. Power shortages, um, uh, load shedding leading to forced shutdowns, and there's also a, another one about um, coal-fired fi power stations um, having unplanned outages. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're, they're all very, very valid um, and good points. Um, uh, we, saw, we saw last year, 2019, quite heavily impacted um, from a supply perspective, specifically in South Africa, as a result of um, um, the ESCOM outages, where um, there was a severe um, load shedding that that occurred. Now, if that happens again, you know that just compounds um, the impact of what we had. I mean, as we said today, is a is a COVID conversation. I think we can't discard the fact, and I and I alluded to that. You know that there are are structural issues um, in South Africa that. That you you know that 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 falls outside and beyond of um, um, just this particular uh, black swan event for for the mining industry, um, and they remain in play and could be exacerbated. So 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 certainly um, uh, the supply of power um, is a concern and 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 certainly could have an impact and and have a further impact. On, on supply uh, for for 2020 at this moment in time in our um, assessments we have we always put in a, um, a, a, a disruption allowance which it would include um, our outlook on whether there would be further um, disruptions from 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 power outages or any other uh, industrial related uh, activities but the predominant impact for 2020 certainly will still remain COVID. Thank, thank you, appreciate that. Um, Oliver, we, we, we did touch on um, hybrids in, in Europe, but we do have another question about the German government subsidies for the plug-in hybrids that you touched on um, with CO2 emissions less than 50 grams per kilometer. 
Um, can the petrol hy hybrids meet these specs or will it continue to fall to diesel hybrids only? Um, so I'm not an expert on this. I would pass yeah. it on to Craig and, and Mark maybe, but, but yeah, yeah. as a different car owner, I just get my hybrid plug-in uh, two weeks ago and on paper, it will meet that specification, even if it's, it's a gasoline plug-in hybrid. Um, yeah. So I think it, it works, you know, depending on, on which regulation you're on. But I think that's more something for Mark or, or Greg to answer. I mean, I would say, uh, Oliver, that uh, from what we think is, um, unless unless diesel comes back in a much bigger way in Europe, the way the way it was historically, EV really is going to be the the main. Uh, EV is going to be the only way to make your CO two uh, or hit your CO two per kilometer spec in Europe. I think that's the main driver for EV growth in Europe is is that particular requirement. Mark, any comments? Um, I'm in North America. I drive a Chevy Bolt, um, so uh, no grams of CO2 per kilometer. Um, no one's talking about the Paris Accord, um, the CO2 limits, and the um, potential OEM financial pen penalties. Um, is this, you know, this is probably a, a, an important part of the discussion with with EVs. That's what I was trying to allude to, Becky, is that yeah. the, the only way to meet the Paris Accord is either to go back to a very heavy diesel segment, uh, which I, I don't know that's likely, it's been since 2015, or, or you're gonna go much heavier into EV. If you just look at the number of models available, I think a year ago it was 50, and now it's, I think someone just told me it's 150 models available. So I think it's a, it's a big point of, of, of how they're gonna get there. Yeah, just just to add to that, as Craig says, it's 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 true. You know, you either go the EV route or you go the uh, the diesel route. And I can't see many uh, o many governments in Europe uh, wanting to aggressively favour uh, diesels, even though that's the right thing to do if you want to get your CO two footprint down. And I think politically, um, it's just something they're not um, uh, not able to do, having you know demonised the diesel engine so much over the last five years. Uh, I think what will be interesting is if we see some of the CO2 uh, legislation uh, being being pushed out. I mean, in, it is enshrined in law in many countries already, uh, but whether we see either a relaxation of the penalties or the implementation timescale, um, I think it's going to be really uh, difficult uh, to slap potentially billions of euros of of, of fines on uh, on OEMs that are already struggling with a collapse in demand and uh, a, an extremely difficult outlook. Uh, so I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, if that was uh, relaxed. Um, what it then means for diesel is, as, as Craig suggests, is, is probably not that great. Um, but similarly, EVs don't necessarily get a big boost from it either. I also think that maybe we need to kind of bring in the discussion. There's been quite a, a lot of news around um, fuel cell technology, you know, that's part of the electric uh, electrification conversation. Um, so I think we just need to kind of take that into consideration as well. Um, Vilma, there, there are some questions about open pit mining um, of palladium and platinum. Is it safer? Is it more secure? Uh, I can put it up there, but uh, <laughs> any comments on open pit mining? Yeah, so so just in terms of open pit mining, of course, um, it, it, if we kind of bring it back to the topic and um, uh, at hand, which is is kind of COVID related, open pit mining is far more far easier to have fewer people to have. Uh, it's it's more mechanized in its approach. So so certainly. Um, that would be favoured, and 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 I think I alluded to it when we had the conversation around how you know how it could structurally change how mining houses plan um, expansion and their capital spend. Um, so certainly, open pit mining will become favoured, and where possible, certainly I think that that. Um, the dollars will be directed in that direction in order to ensure that we have continued supply. Thank you, Wilma. Yeah, and I think just just to add to what Wilma says, as you as Wilma knows very well, a lot of South African mining is is, is legacy mining. It's it's deep level. 
uh, mining which isn't suitable to open pit and and those are the ones that take a lot of uh, a lot of people underground and you know actually enforcing social distancing when you've got to get potentially several thousand people underground per shift in very tight proximity i mean some of the stopes uh, the mining uh, sections are only uh, one meter deep at maximum anyway so how you enforce social distancing in that sort of environment is is extremely challenging um so in in the immediate term yes it's it's going to get very difficult uh, to reopen some of these shafts um which employ large numbers of people in close proximity um longer term of course you know if it i guess it, it comes back to the the, the whole healthcare idea that we need to uh, have a vaccine or, or some better testing and tracing um, as, as is being looked at. Uh, but for the moment, I'd be very surprised if those uh, deep level mines can get back to anything like normal production uh, with the current restraints on COVID. Craig, did you want to say something? No, I think I think a very key point that John made, John, Jonathan made during his presentation was that the mines are not all equal and the mechanized mines can operate fairly freely right now, but they're, but they're light in rhodium. And where you have to go deep and where, you ha where, you, where it's gonna be really hard to socially distance, that's where you're rich in rhodium. And I think, I think that's an, it's a main driver for the supply demand balance. Thank you. I'm looking to see if we, we have some more questions coming up, but um, let's see. Um, anyone? Yeah, I'll put this up here uh, from Alexi. Has has someone estimated the cost of recycling the spent fuel cells against spent autocats? Um, and is it going to be competitive for the future secondary supply for those of us who are involved in secondaries? Thanks, Alexi. Could I could comment on that? So I think it's... Uh... I think that the catalyst or the, the, the membrane from a, from a fuel cell that carries of the platinum catalyst might be maybe similar. It's a little bit trickier on the HF problem there with a, with a nafion. Um, but the key is collection and, and dismantling of this material. Yeah, so I think that's more where the costs are. You know, fuel cells is like a, a huge device. Uh, a catalyst, basically, you, you, you cut up the can, remove the ceramic millet, send it for refining. Uh, a fuel cell is like a, a little power plant that, that have uh, electronic devices, um, yeah, some, some other material on there that need to be taken apart before it can hit into a refinery or into recycling. So it's a difficult approach, but uh, of course, yeah, you need fuel cell recycling if you want to go to a hydro, uh, yeah, hydrogen energy in the future. Yeah, there's so much, like, I think JM mentioned like 10 million ounces by 2050 or something going into fuel cells. So you need recycling, obviously, to do that. So uh, I maybe can second, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'd second uh, Oliver on that. Uh, Umoco takes in uh, membranes from fuel cell stacks, but we do not take fuel cell stacks. So there is a need in the in society for collectors of fuel cell stacks and dismantlers of fuel cell stacks uh, before the platinum containing membrane can be recycled. And it can be recycled. We've got a couple of other really good questions. Um, one on leasing and what also, uh, one, are there any smelters developing or adopting new technolo technologies to better cope with um, silicon carbide or, or some of the other complex and difficult materials? Shall I give a stab at that one? Go ahead, Ed Mark. Umacore. So, so, so basically, Umacore um, is a complex smelter. So we take in a lot of different materials. Um, and yes, we, we can process those materials. So you don't need to build a, a new smelter or a new technology. Um, every material has its technical challenges. Uh, nothing is easy, but none of the materials that Umoco processes are easy. Uh, but uh, for the time being, we can uh, process uh, these materials, albeit albeit not pure or not in large quantities, but we can uh, process these. Right. 
Craig, did you want to... That, the, oh, this issue, I mean, you remember late last year um, when we were, um, uh, or actually earlier this year when we, we had the, the PRC uh, in, uh, in Texas, you know, this was one of the key issues. This was the time when before COVID, everything was going great guns on, on the recycling side. Uh, prices were stimulating returns of, of more material. The car, the car sector was, was still looking pretty healthy. And, and that was one of the major issues is, is these increasingly complex silicon or, or titanate based materials. And, and I think that this um, pause in a lot of refining operations because of COVID has actually been a chance to catch up. I mean, correct, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but this, um, uh, this stockpile of material that was built up uh, at the end of last year and early this year, that's been worked down. Um, but the, the, the fundamental issue hasn't gone away, and that's a, a lack of, of ultimate processing capacity. Uh, and getting uh, palladium and rhodium out turns out in a, in a timely manner. Uh, and you add to this the, the issues that um, some of the, um, uh, the, the smelters will have had because of COVID, because of transportation issues, as has been uh, referred to. I still see this as um, causing a degree of physical tightness in the market going forward. There's plenty of material available, but it's just how quickly you can get that to out turn. Uh, okay. yeah, no. Sorry, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I think there's there's multiple questions to this. I think, John, you're right, though. In, in the last quarter of 2019 or in the beginning of 2020, there was a, a huge, I would call it, oversupply of spent catalysts in the market. So backlogs at refineries everywhere and, and high lease rates, high metal prices. Um, yeah, physical uh, deliveries were, were squeezed. So I think the refineries choose the material that fits best in the smelter first and push it through as quick as they can and everything that is um, like aluminum titanate or silicon carbide is a proper material and especially these are both diesel materials with no rhodium so they may be stockpiled them and processed richer material and better material first and i'm sure i think now with, with less at the moment or the backlogs being down i think uh, some some players come back and take this material but going forward, I think it's still an issue. And I think it's not only a smelting issue. If we talk about aluminum titanate, I think titanium oxide, for example, will be a, a hazardous substance in the European Union 2021. And it could be not only the smelting, but also the handling and processing be a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that brings up the point of, um, of premiums and, and borrowing premiums on the metals um some increased delivery we had a question from chris thatcher about increased delivery on paper um, of palladium and what's the effect going to be on borrowing premiums yeah i mean i think it's, it's a great question and um you know to, to my mind i don't think the the physical tightness uh, in palladium has necessarily gone away we're still uh, seeing a, a deficit market fundamentally, uh, even though it's a much uh, lower deficit than we'd have expected at the start of the year. Um, the, the, the fact remains that uh, metal for immediate delivery remains um, strongly bit, and that could uh, include some um, delivery of, of paper contracts into physical, uh, just as we've seen in some of the other precious metals, or it could simply be that industrial users uh, just simply need that metal. It's not a speculative play, it's, it's purely uh, industrial. Um, and, and I think as the auto industry comes back uh, and recovers to a degree, we are going to see more of that. And that's probably going to push that backwardation uh, back up again, um, particularly if the physical availability of, of mined or recycled metal doesn't keep track of that rise in demand. Um, so I think potentially, you know, we're still going to, going to see a, a fundamental shortage of metal in the market, and, and probably that means uh, we're back to, to some somewhat higher lease rates. Hopefully not to the 20 or 40 or 50 percent that we've seen at various times in the last two years, but certainly a little higher than we see right now. And I think that does also um, coincide with the second part of the question, the promise of unlimited QE. Well, you know, we're seeing it already. We've, we've heard the ECB today. Um, the Fed ha are going pretty aggressively on this as well. What that does, it keeps the real uh, interest rate extremely low, particularly when we start to see inflation coming back. Um, and therefore, holding precious metals as investments becomes more attractive as a non-yielding asset. Now, for the last two years, we've not really seen that in the structured product space in palladium. We've seen it more in the over-the-counter market where uh, semi-pros have been buying and holding on to physical metal. Uh, but if we start to see any activity coming back in the 
uh, non-commercial futures market on NYMEX or uh, the exchange traded funds, just of, as we've seen very heavy inflows into platinum ETFs over the last year or so, that could also um, take some physical supply off the market. The thing about uh, exchange traded funds is that they are physically backed. You hold that metal off market. Um, and those have contributed metal back to the market over the last several years. But if investors turn more bullish on palladium because of the prospects for the auto industry and because of the general promise uh, of, of a low yield environment, uh, then that could really start to, to impact on physical availability uh, furthermore. Thank you, John. I think we have a question from the audience about the demand for lithium ion battery technology to accelerate um, the development of next gen. Let me put that up and the, um, the use of platinum and palladium. Um, so what do you think about the demand from Lithium Ion Technologies, Inc. to accelerate the development of the next-gen battery technology using platinum and palladium? I think the question is not limited to the, the Lithium Ion Battery Technologies company, of course. I'm not, I'm not aware of uh, platinum and palladium being used in Lithium Ion Batteries. <laughs> Or be it uh, all the better for, uh, for the IPMI if there is. Yeah, 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 yeah. We also have a question about um, will there be a possibility of tighter restrictions in Russia at the moment, do you think? And what the consequences would be on the mid, uh, short and midterm market? Uh, may, maybe I can just wait. You know, I, I think if there is, it's, it's really hard to know whether there will be, but I think we can more talk about the consequences if there would be a, a restriction. Um, in terms of, of, of supply, um, certainly that would tighten the market even more. Palladia, um, Russia is an Im very important, from a supply perspective, a very important um, uh, supplier of, of palladium. And, and, and any decision there um, to, uh, or, or any decision around restriction um, could certainly have an impact. I think Jonathan alluded, and we've also um, publicly, as Metal Focus, we've we, we, we've advised that there's a, 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 a deficit, a small deficit this year, but, but certainly um, any activity or any changes in policy um, uh, from a supply perspective from Russia would have uh, a, an immediate impact um, and that would create greater tightness and that would have an impact on, on price, certainly. Thank you, Vilma. Thank you. Um, you know, we, we're, we're getting toward the probably the 10, 13 minute mark before 1130 Eastern. Um, but I, I was thinking we did have a few questions about, um, well, we talked about physical delivery. We also talked about, um, you know, a, a lot of folks have asked just about um, quality control within, within recycling and within refining. Um, does, you know, chain of custody, do, does anyone on the panel just want to comment briefly on um, thoughts about any changes, any improvements, any anything having to do with delivery of metal or within the recycling. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, looking at the questions from the panel. But um, I mean, I I, I could take it, uh, Becky. So. So yeah, the one the one change that we've that we've seen, you know, because of COVID and social distancing, okay. is is there hasn't been a whole lot of witnessing. You know, sites sites won't let witnesses in. So it's important it's important to ask the right questions of your processor of your refiner. Ask questions about how are they sampling? How do they account for moisture? Ask questions about their assay labs. Are they are they ISO certified? Are they compliant? Talk about the chain of custody. And, and when you can, and you will be able to, if not this week, very soon, you will be able to witness your lots again. And uh, periodically it's, it, it's recommended. Yeah. Anyone else, Oliver? It, you know, COVID is changing. As you've said, Craig, COVID is really changing the way we have visitors into our facilities. Um, it's also, we had some questions about um, just travel bans. Um, even Oliver alluded to it. Um, you know, earlier when we were talking, but um, how do we think the travel restrictions, does anyone want to comment on what they're seeing in their facilities? We have an upcoming IPMI conference in the fall, um, business travel, does anyone want to comment as, as we begin to to kind of come to a close on, on their thoughts about, you know, what yeah, we're so doing? In Europe, we start seeing, uh, so I think Germany will, will release or will go away from all the travel warnings mid-June, 
Um, I think most European countries uh, will open their borders again. I think Spain is a little bit behind that and, and Norway, um, but the, the big countries uh, will open. Um, this is for tourist travel. I think uh, business travel was always allowed, uh, but it could end up in, in self-isolation two weeks when you return or when you enter a country. I think this is mid-June, this will almost be done in, in Europe. Um, personally, I, uh, well, my view is that, that business travel long haul, like going to Asia from Europe or going to the US will be difficult for the next couple of months, if not anything happened in 2020. I think Lufthansa and other airlines would love to, to get business travelers back on board, but uh, actually, uh, I don't know if we're sitting with 400 people in a, in a 747 going 12 hours flight, don't see it. Right. Um, we do have another question from the audience and I'm trying to get the last questions in and it's about the India market. Um, what is your view on the India market, market as long um, pending vehicle scrappage policy is gonna go be rolled out maybe this year or the beginning of next? Anyone have any thoughts on India? I mean, I think maybe we could just mention, uh, I, I, I'm sure that the rest of the panel would have very strong views around the scrappage schemes, et cetera, uh, and specifically the recycling side. But, but just I think that it, it was quite significant. India certainly didn't have any sales last uh, last month. And, 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 and I think that there's a, a significant um, impact on the, the automotive market. There's been quite a drastic decline um, in, in outlook in sales on, on vehicles. So, so this, this scrapping of vehicles will be associated with the availability of vehicles. So I think that um, uh, from from our missile focuses perspective, we certainly have seen that um, India will be, uh, from an automotive perspective, quite heavily impacted and, and a downgrade in the demand there. From a from a recycling perspective, I'm going to leave it to uh, the other the other panel members to perhaps comment on that. I, I could comment just for a second because I thought of something while you were speaking. Um, first, BSF does produce automotive catalyst in India. I think some others do as well. It's a, it's a growing, strong market in most cases. On the scrap side, though, it's just becoming uh, an opportunity. And, and what we've, we've talked to a few people, and the difficulty, uh, and I'm talking to you, Becky and Oliver, because we talked about this a few months ago, is getting AML. Okay, so, I mean, the, the sophistication level has to be to a point where you can get to know your customer and get the AML vetting done. And and the, so the scrappers in, in India have to be able to, to comply with this and provide the kind of data that we would get out of Europe and out of North America, and that's that may be one of the one of the tougher challenges in the short term. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Jane, we have another. Wilma, you have another question. Um, James wanted to thank you for the power outage answer, but he also said, with more people working from home, um, the consequent increase in the summer months, will the AC loadings uh, may increase the risk of of load shedding? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting question, and certainly um, there is a possibility around that. But I do think that what one must put it into context in in many ways that manufacturing is the larger consumer of um, electricity, so it will be more driven, I would think, um, around. Um, the the ability for South Africa to to lift its economy to get back to um, industrial activity that would have a far greater impact on whether load shedding um, will occur this summer or not. I, I think it's important to take that into consideration, and we certainly will see uh, an increased demand um, from an air conditioning per perspective, etc. When when they go into summer, but at the moment it's uh, winter. So. Um, there you go. So yeah. opposite and, hemisphere. The the opposite is also true. So from a from from from, from a cold perspective, you also need heating, etc. So all those factors are important, but I think we do need to kind of place into context the consumption levels um, that occur, and that it's a so significantly more biased towards um, the industrial activity. Thank you, Vilma. That's great. Doesn't do any of our panelists have any comments? Um, before we bring Larry back, I just want to thank everyone. Um, anything that you want to add for the good of the group? It's so nice to have so many watching and participating um, globally. We can see that you're that you're joined us um, through our YouTube numbers. So thank you for being with us. But anyone else from the uh, panel? Any yeah, comments? Just say, as we as we normally would have this 
conference, our IPMI annual conference uh, starting tomorrow in, in lovely Las Vegas. And due to COVID-19, we're all sitting here in front of the PC screen and, and watching it, which I think was a good idea to show uh, that we are still there and that there's always uh, reasons to meet and to discuss. So, and I look forward that we all see us in person soon, even if we are Europeans still not allowed to travel to the United States. Hopefully this will change. And yeah, I look forward to see you all in person and discuss these issues in more detail. Thanks, Becky, for all Thank you, Mr. IPMI President. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, you all can continue to comment. I'm gonna bring Larry back, our Executive Director of IPMI. Thank you, Becky. Uh, I'd like to uh, personally thank the, uh, the team that made this uh, production uh, possible. Um, Becky Berube, Sandy, Sandra Arantz, and our partners at Kitco, John uh, Drakas and Callan Kalano. And last but not least, our wonderful panel. I think you, you all did a, a tremendous job today and provided a uh, tremendous service to our members. And to all you out there on the call, as I said in the beginning, uh, I would really like this to be the start of the learning process on, on uh, from this webinar. And, um, urge you to uh, connect with each other and build upon that. And as uh, as you're doing so, you'll continue to build strong relationships, which is really at the heart of what IPMI is about. Um, we are planning some more uh, webinars in, in the uh, near future. Our next one will be July 22nd, and it will uh, be focused on security and anti-money laundering challenges and response during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, obviously, it's looking at the uh, the supply chain and the compliance uh, uh, issues that that that, uh, that are some of the challenges that we all uh, face in this industry, which uh, during COVID-19 is uh, ratcheted up those challenges. So uh, we look forward in a, a little over a month to have that that uh, conference. Um, just uh, one little bit of a plug uh, for IPMI, for those of you who are on the call who are not members, we're a global organization and have uh, many uh, uh, committees and chapters uh, that touch on various things, such as uh, security, health and safety, environmental regulations, legislative affairs and such. So uh, I encourage you to uh, check us out on your website and uh, you'll find out more about us and uh, look forward to uh, some um, announcements on some of the upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, one thing I can guarantee you as a member, you will connect to a vast majority of the industry players in, in precious metals. You'll learn from them and you'll build relationships with them, which is in my uh, career found to be one of the most important uh, uh, things that I got out of being involved with IPMI. So thank you all. We look forward to having you uh, at future webinars and God willing, hope to see you at our platinum dinner in New York City, uh, which is September 17th. We're going to, we're continuously monitoring uh, uh, what's happening in New York City and the, and the current regulations. So there'll be more to follow on that. And as Oliver was uh, alluding to, our, uh, our annual conference is November 14th to 17th in Las Vegas. I wish you and your families and colleagues all the best in these, uh, in these trying times. And please abide by all the recommended precautions and be safe. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.